tables I gave you our low fire list and just for this semester we have $800 towards glazes that we're going to go through a lot of those. Escape. Escape. There we go. And that's just the low fire. I haven't even gone over the high fire yet. So you'll see the difference. Okay so mostly for your notes I'm not looking for detailed notes I'm looking to see that you followed along with the slides. So I tried to highlight in yellow the most important thing. So for your notes, you got your name and your period at the top. Glazing notes, you can title it. And privilege, not a right. So glazing is a privilege. It's not required by the curriculum in any way. Um, we could be simply using watercolor or a lot of kids at schools that have no money just build clay, take pictures, and they have to destroy it to reuse the clay. Super, super lucky here. I know we know that we think that South has everything, but we have a lot here that we offer, and we're getting quite a bit of money for those projects. So this is hands-on learning. This is what we're trying to get math and everybody else to do, is like not just learn quiz, learn quiz, like actually do physical projects. Anyways, moving on, glazing. Okay, so you have your bisque square. Your bisque, B-I-S-Q-U-E, your bisque square has been once fired, so now it's strong. So bisque fire is your first firing. Bisque wear is your once fired clay object. The opposite, when all this stuff that's drying out is called green wear. It wasn't that important to, I don't think at that time to tell you, but the bisque wear is important. So you can't apply glaze to the wet clay because it might mix in with the clay. It's not the end of the world, it just isn't the right process. It's not professional. You'll end up with clay pieces and the glaze will be muddled. Okay, so the low fire, we talk about low fire and high fire. The low fire temperature is called cone 06. Low fire temperature, that 06 is the most important. Six is the opposite. Before they had electric kilns, they had to, in the kiln, just like plug holes into areas to try and keep the heat in. And when they wanted it cooler, they had to like open the top, it was called damper, and let heat out at a certain time and show up in the middle of the night and, you know, gauge the kiln. We're super lucky to have this electrical kiln 20, 30 years later that does that. Um, so your oven at home gets how hot? You want, your, you want nachos and you want them toasted right away. How much? 400. 400 hotter. 500. 500 degrees. After 500 degrees, your oven maxes out. So when you hit broil, you're at, you're hot. 500 degrees is as hot as your oven gets. Our kiln gets to 2,800 degrees. Significantly hotter. That's right? So it will incinerate. You can't put glue in there. Glue will burn away at 100 degrees. Um, most metals burn away at or they melt down at 1500 degrees. So the look of the two glazes is really the benefit to deciding. So let's say you want fine detail, like these uh, silhouettes of the people, you would use low fire glaze. 
So think about your design, bless you. If you want tiny little dots that don't drip, you would use low fire glaze. If you're, I guess I'll just use this one. If you're wanting something more textured, this might just be one or two glazes layered in high fire. It's super unpredictable. We do have samples that I've been running up here that show mostly what it's gonna look like. Um, it tends to be more advanced because kids are a little more willing to experiment and get a better feel. So ideally you'd be working in low fire, but if you're more advanced or you really want a color that's in high fire, I'm gonna be running both kilns in different temperatures. So you'll just be choosing and putting it on the shelf that it correlates with. Everything should be labeled. All right. No question for this slide. All right. These have been ordered three times and I'm yet to find the delivery of the box. All right. Any day. I mean, we ordered from Amazon a while back. So these pallets are, I have some, but they're just really messy. Um, and we can get those if we need to. If not, I have other things. But the pallets are used to keep your glazes separate and to keep you organized. So you would keep those, um, you can save, you know, the glaze will dry out. You saw the dry glazes. It dries out after like two or three days uncovered with air. So I have had kids use plastic on top of the glazes, but then they smear. So you really just want to use as much glaze as you're going to need for that particular day or share with a friend. Hey, you're both doing red. Let's use the same well. They're called wells right there. Um, labeling the numbers, that's just another level. What I used to have the kids do is draw a sketch, point out the color you're going to do, what color is that going to be, what number color is that. I really think with our seniors we need to move things along. So I do say that planning is helpful, but at this age I don't know that you're necessarily <coughs> that's going to benefit you as much as I thought it has in the past. Okay. Uh, I recommend if you're if you're stuck on colors and you don't know what to do, try and stay within an analogous color scheme. An analogous color scheme would be three, four, or five colors side by side on your color wheel. So if you were to do red, you could pick red violet, red orange, then you could maybe do violet and orange, but I wouldn't pass and go into these areas. And this is an ombre. I have an ombre how-to video, O-M-B-R-E. Um, so that's just an idea because you want to have your colors unified. You don't want it to be all random. That's what makes your work look the best and the most advanced. All right, so how do you glaze? We have our brushes over here and they're softer brushes. They're very similar to watercolor because with the, oh, this one. they're kind of fluffy. If they're hard, they kind of scrape the glaze off when we do second and third coats and we don't want that. So glaze, it's liquid glass, not paint, and it's made of a mixture of silica, flint, and oxide. So oxides are mostly the colorants. Flint is a flux that helps with it melting, and silica is dangerous for your lungs when breathed in in quantities. They're tiny, tiny little particles that we can't filter out. So you obviously don't want to eat the glaze. Once it's fired, it's food safe. Right. Why do we glaze? Why do we glaze? It seals the clay so water can't penetrate through. So seals the clay is one reason. Second reason, decorative. Simply decorative. People for thousands of years have wanted to do color. The most basic form is terracotta clay, which is that orangey clay that you usually see at like Home Depot. That terracotta clay is the most abundant and cheapest. And sometimes people do terracotta slip on top of their work. That's another go colorant option. Hmm? Mm -hmm. Go back? Yeah, one before this. This one or the one before? One before. Okay. All right. Thank you. you all see stuff? I'm moving through this guy. All right, so a kiln, you've seen this, I've showed you all, is a, uh, is a furnace for firing clay. This one's actually done and needs to get unloaded. There's a dangerous part in the kiln, which is why I don't have you help load and um, I have you help with the work, but not the shelves. In everything, even your oven, it's called a thermocouple. It's a little thing that sticks out. It's like a thermometer. It's really fragile. And it's the thing that tells you the heat in the kiln. It's the, heat that, the thing that tells you in your oven how hot your oven is. How does your oven know? It has a little thermostat in it. 
So if that breaks, our kiln breaks. That's no fun. Um, takes a while to get replaced. Kiln shelf, heavy, doesn't burn away in the kiln. And the way I... Hmm? Ooh, that's a good question. Do you want to look it up later? It's something very strong. These are our posts. So, I'm literally, I don't know if everyone says literally, building shelves because we're stacking pieces. The difference with glazing, and I think I'm going to get to it the next slide. Kiln pose. Yes, you want to glaze on the inside. It helps seal it. I mean, unless you're using it not. Like if you want to use it for a pencil holder, that's fine. But most people choose to glaze on the inside. Um, huge problem with glaze. Let's say you're glazing something in pink and the glaze, the liquid glaze actually looks pink. Well, it's going to mix into your piece and you're going to think that you've glazed everything. But what I've learned over the years is, with even with my own work, I did not glaze everything. Because this piece right here, all these little imperfections or areas missed makes this piece not so hot, all right? It doesn't look advanced. The clay work is, I think, pretty neat. They've slipped and scored things on, but this just looks like elementary. And I think it's simply because a person either didn't have the time, a lot of times it's, you just don't have the time. So I'm allocating you two weeks for glazing. So I'm giving you the time to be able to go through it. I'm even gonna be bringing in magnifying glasses. A lot of kids will use their phone, turn the phone flashlight on, you'll go, oh, I missed that. Or look at it sideways, ask a friend. It's one of the biggest deals with glazing that I've seen is kids get upset at the end and they're like, oh. and then you have to reglaze it and then we have to refire it and sometimes it doesn't get done in time. It's not the end of the world, it's just not great. Um, okay, big deal, I will not fire your work. Anything that touches the shelf. So you cannot glaze anything that touches the kiln shelf. So the bottom. Well, what if you have a lid? What if you have a lid? So let's say you're putting on a fire piece. Let's say this is the lid, just for, for fun. Let's say this is the lid and you put it on and we put it in the kiln like this together. What happens in the kiln to both the pieces? They fuse together. Fuse together, melt together, okay? Can't get them off after that. We, when that's happened, we've had side-by-side -side pieces that were touching in the kiln and then we have to chisel them apart. Sometimes it works and then after that, the, the bisque is usually really sharp so I've cut myself multiple times and then we have a grinder to grind it down. So it's not fun. So when I load the kiln, I'm extremely careful to keep everything separate. But your job is to make sure there's no glaze on the bottom. So if this were your lid, this were the bottom of your lid, glaze everywhere except for whatever's touching the kiln shelf. So everything, that's the biggest one. Make sure you got that on your notes. So like if it was your little foot, you could glaze everywhere but what's touching the kiln shelf. Literally, you could glaze up to a few millimeters with the low fire. Whoops, you got glaze on the bottom. Not a big deal. Just take a sponge, squeeze it out, scrub it off. Okay. Um, that is a room kiln shelf. That was a high fire piece where the piece fused to the kiln shelf and it was chiseled off. And then we'd have to chisel the whole thing off and put on a clear wash again. It's just not fun. Accidents happen, but we can prevent them. Talked about color unity throughout. This just looks like they mixed a ton of different glazes and we're waiting for a surprise. I couldn't plan that. All right, these are my glazes we used at my old school. I've organized this so that you have, I'm gonna turn on the light. So we have a brand called Stroke & Coat. That's, these are all new bottles. What's nice about these ones, very, they actually discontinued those, I don't know why. But these ones, they look a lot like what the actual glaze color is. So when you see the blue, it actually might be a blue close to this. So Stroke & Coat is, Mako is the vendor, which the vendor would be the supplier. So they're like, they would be our Nike, okay? Um, Stroke & Coat is the type of glaze. On these particular glazes, they have gloss in them. 
So they're already got the clear overglaze in them. So you don't need it. I had, you can do everything in one firing if you like. We'll talk about shiny and matte in just a minute. And then the number is really important. What number do you see right there? Letter, two letters and two numbers. SC30. 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 Let's say someone's using, Mary's got SC30 over here. Xavier's looking for SC30. I have a few, I have extra replicas of them, all right? Um, they shouldn't be separated, they should all be mixed. You really don't want to shake, shake it, you want it to turn it, but um, you don't want the air bubbles. So that's our studio organization system and you'll put them back in the slots. Not leave them at the sink, like that never happens. And then, don't keep them at your, if you, once you dispense what you need, try not to keep them at your tables so that way others can find them. We have a small, I used to have so many more kids, so I think it's gonna be a lot easier in here. All right, three vocabulary words. Matt, M-A-T-T-E. So one of the definitions of matte would be it's not shiny. This paint is a matte paint. You are repainting your bedroom and you don't, let's say it's got some holes in the wall and it's kind of messy, like some of my walls. You want to use a matte because you don't see all the shiny imperfections. It kind of masks it all. Satin is a dull shine. Satin is a great option for a kitchen wall because you can still wipe them off when spaghetti sauce gets on them. Matt, you get spaghetti sauce stain, stains on them. And then glossy, obviously, is that really high shine um, on that green piece. So this would be a gloss finish. When you do shellac on your nails, that might be a gloss finish. So we have, the samples are done with carved lines and they have extra sample pieces. The reason we do those lines is because if you had carved lines, you want to see what happens in those lines. And what I saw, we just did samples last week with some of my other, with my other class, they didn't glaze inside the lines. So it just looked pink like the clay. So we had to reglaze them, all right? I need to get those magnifying glasses and make that really big deal because it looks like you will have glazed, but you're missing spots. And then where it cools so when they when if you have like a divot place will puddle there and usually looks pretty cool especially on your texture pieces one coat versus three coats is different maybe you choose one coat maybe you want that look um maybe you have your piece that's all white and then you do pink petals on top you might want one coat and then two coats maybe just on the sides to give it depth it's all up to you but if you want that solid coating that's not splotchy it would be paint a coat let it dry paint a coat let it dry placemat always placemats are over here and anything that's uh, got a shine to it should be good these are dried on glazes if they get re-wetted re-wet then they'll transfer into your glaze. So if you really want a clean place mat, wipe them off, but it hasn't really been an issue. Um, I also have trays. Well, I'm on the thought of this. These lockers are new to me. I had one kid in the school, they pulled out their piece, I can't remember if it was class, and then the piece rolled out of their locker and broke. Um, because there's a little lip on the locker. So my last school, they could easily see in the lockers and they kept everything in their locker, like their bisqueware, and they kept everything for glazing in their locker. I think that will work if we're very careful. But I'm, one, I'm gonna play this out with you guys. See, help me problem solve, because... Um, the other thought I had is like, if I could find boxes like this that would slide in and out of your lockers, because I'm just really nervous that your piece might, like, oh, you're taking out this beautiful piece and then the wing gets knocked off. But if we had them maybe in a box or a shoe box, would that be easier or you feel like you don't need that? That'd be easier. Okay. So I'll just try and start bringing sure. as many shoe boxes as I can. I gotta go shoe shopping. Does anyone already have shoe boxes at home? Maybe the Amazon boxes. I'll ask around. Maybe Foods has something that's our size. Okay. But otherwise, I think when we glaze, the safest might be storing on your sh on the shelf still, but being very careful not to reach anyone else's. Like you don't want to knock someone else's. So that's our storage thing right here. Big deal. Um, so I have 
white. And seventh period, not my class, another class was using our glazes, the other teacher. And they, they used a color with one brush. And then they went into the white, because I have white in two containers. They went into the white with the brush. What happens to a blue brush that goes into a white container? They're gonna mix and turn not white, okay? So they're gonna contaminate, it's called soft contamination, when they contaminate the whole bottle. So if you've ever worked in foods, you know that chicken is cross-contamination when you don't sanitize your hands. So what that means is, if you're doing five different colors, you're probably gonna have five different brushes. If the person before you didn't clean out the brush, because it kind of turned to powder, and let's say, we don't know, this might have blue at the base, and then you squeeze a little bit of white and it might mix in. Sometimes you can't tell. So I'm, I'm to help you the best clean out your brushes um, when you use them so that we don't end up with this cross contamination and it saves so much on everything. Um, so yeah, the, some of the brushes are $5.15. Those were prices years ago. They're not cheap to get these kind of glazed brushes. Uh, ombre, let's see what else I have going on here. We already watched that one. These are for the wealth, they have to be getting delivered. I'm gonna go nuts if they don't. And then, ooh, that was right, less than 25 minutes. Okay, so you have your notes. Do you have any questions? Be honest, I need to know if I missed anything. No. Oh, uh, can we mix like colors in a separate container? Can you mix colors in a separate container? The answer is yes, but. Let's say Gus wants to create, because we don't have some colors here. Let's say you want to create a purple. What two colors make purple? Red and blue. Red and blue. So for your purple, because I would love to see that example. They're going to turn out really neat. 50% purple, 50%, what do we say? Oh, no, red and blue. 50% red, 50% blue in a little container, and then we can run a sample on it. So we cover it, and then we can see what it looks like or you can just apply it. And I keep these samples. So I would say on this new sample that I hung up for years, it'll say SC30 and SC16 mixed equally. And then we'll hang that up when we have a new sample. So if you invent a sample, please let me know. Otherwise, they're just gonna be forgotten. And someone will go, how did they make that? I'm gonna say, I don't know, they did three colors, but they didn't remember. Um, so for sanding, if you want to sand, it's optional. Sandpapers have different grits to them. If they feel smoother, they're barely going to do anything for sanding. The thicker ones get rid of more major stuff. It's optional. You don't have to. But if you are going to sand, do it over the garbage. We don't want those little pieces to get stuck into our clay. And I'm missing anything else. Sanding, rinsing them off. I would definitely rinse them. I've got, I wear a lot of lotion. And when I've had lotion on my hands, it's transferred onto my piece, so the oils resist the glaze. So in certain areas, if you have oils on your clay, on your bisqueware, it's not gonna glaze as well. So try and keep your glaze, your bisqueware clean. I'm gonna give you this time for digital images and you have the rest of the period for yourself. Um, make sure you all the clays out of your lockers. And then last thing would be wheel people. You need to check your wheels and make sure they're cleaned up. Cool. Oh. Okay. The rest of the period for yourself. <laughs> I need to know. Wash out for lotion. That's a good question. Oh.